A breakthrough or a breakdown? That is what is at stake in the next nine days. Debt ceiling negotiations between congressional Republicans and the White House are continuing over this holiday weekend. And in the last few hours, both sides say they are closing in on a deal. The deadline for when the United States risks defaulting on its loans, an unprecedented economic disaster, is becoming clearer, with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen consistently warning that default could take place sometime in early June. Lawmakers have been operating on a June 1st deadline. Yellen has now updated that estimate to June 5th. But the urgency of raising the debt ceiling remains. Now, a deal is within reach, but we are waiting for specifics. Here's what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told our reporters just a few hours ago. I'm not fearful of what this, what's in this bill. And from what we've been able to achieve, we to spend less money, to put us on a trajectory. Now, is it everything I wanted? No, it has to pass the Senate and get signed by the president. But I firmly believe that people, if they sit back and look at this on from all of America will say, you know what? That's a much better product than what was happening in the past. So what will we be looking for when we finally get our hands on this bill? Well, one issue is whether the White House succeeded in blocking Republican efforts to impose work requirements for low-income Americans. These would apply to benefits like SNAP, which you might know as food stamps, and temporary assistance for needy families, or TANF, as it's usually called. The monthly checks are distributed by the states. Here's what Republican Congressman Garrett Graves said about calls for work requirements just yesterday. Democrats right now are willing to default on the debt so they can so they can continue making welfare payments for people that are refusing to work. And I'm talking about people that are without dependence, people that are able-bodied between 18 and 55. Are you willing to drop that work requirements and just hell no, hell no, not a chance. Mm. Well, the White House, they are just as adamant, releasing a statement that says, quote, House Republicans are threatening to trigger an unprecedented recession and cost the American people over 8 million jobs unless they can take food out of the mouths of hungry Americans. Now, if you were at a cookout or a soccer game this weekend and you started asking folks if they'd support work requirements for receiving checks that are funded by the taxpayers, on its face, it might sound reasonable, right? So they might say yes. But my friends, things are not always as they seem. So let's unpack this together. Last month, the House narrowly passed a bill that increases the debt limit, but only if it includes crippling spending cuts. This is a bill that is not getting to become law. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that this particular proposal would save $4.8 trillion over the next 10 years. But how much of that savings is from work requirements? $120 billion over the next 10 years. That is just 2.5% of the package's total savings. And while some Republican members of Congress perpetuate myths that legions of people are living comfortably on government assistance without working, adding to the labor shortages, the data doesn't support that. First, we have record low unemployment. And there is not a single state in the country where the maximum TANF benefits would lift a family of three above 60 percent of the poverty line. And that's according to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. <sighs> Look, y'all, I know the numbers can be overwhelming, so here's the bottom line. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that Republicans in Congress would rather slash financial lifelines for the Americans who need it the most than save more by making sure the wealthiest among us pay their fair share. That's what I call irresponsible. Joining me now to discuss is Democratic Congressman and Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Stephen Horsford of Nevada. Greetings to you, uh, sir. I want to start where I left off, um, the debt ceiling negotiations. What do you know about the negotiations at this moment? Well, first of all, thank you, Simone, for having me. I'm here in South Carolina in, in front of the Emanuel AME Church. Uh, we were leading the launch of our democracy uh, for the People launch uh, with Congressman Jim Clyburn. And I'm so thankful that you started your segment uh, uh, on the issues that you are, because this is about actually making work pay for itself, uh, making sure that people actually can have family-sustaining jobs that provide enough pay to cover housing and childcare and transportation. So instead of uh, Republicans uh, holding our economy hostage by not pay paying our uh, raising the debt limit, they are literally um, risking millions of jobs, eight more than 8 million jobs that could be lost 
uh, if we're not able to reach agreement. Now, I, I, I hear promising things. I know Mr. Clyburn had a, 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 a remarks with the president uh, yesterday, and so I'm hopeful uh, that we'll be able to reach an agreement soon, but we're just days away, um, and it's time for Republicans to vote with Democrats uh, on a clean debt ceiling so that we can uh, save our economy and prioritize our budget and our spending going forward. Congressman, let, let's talk about uh, when the bill, when, when and if a bill um, does manifest itself. What would be a red line for uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus, but also Democrats in the House? You, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus has come out um, against work requirements, along with members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. What are some of the red lines here? Because Democrats, it looks like, are going to have to vote for um, a bill. Look, I, I don't believe in red lines. What I am for is work paying for itself. We believe that people should have good paying jobs. And unfortunately, as you indicated, we have some major corporations uh, who not only don't pay a good livable wage, we literally have people who are in uh, low-end jobs who also qualify for benefits. And I really want to underscore who we're talking about here. Overwhelmingly, the people who receive benefits under these programs are children. So are we really going to take food away from needy children, seniors, and veterans simply because the Republicans want to get their way? So we're willing to work with whoever on either side of the aisle, but what we're, what we're not willing to do is to have our constituents held hostage or for the budget to be balanced on the backs of the very people uh, that we represent. That's not what the Congressional Black Caucus stands for. You know, uh, Congressman Horsford, you have just delivered um, a point that I had not heard from anyone at the White House uh, about who is disproportionately impacted by, uh, you know, these, this benefits conversation around work requirements. You have actually called on President Biden to deliver a national address on what is at stake in these negotiations. Uh, how do you feel? First of all, has the White House responded to um, your urging? And, and then how do you feel that the White House has communicated uh, either what is it well or not well with Democratic members of Congress, but also the American people about what's really happening here? Well, I've been in touch with representatives from the White House. And look, I, I, I give credit where credit is due. And I also uh, talk frankly. And what I, I, I'll just say is I, I think the president has the ability to use the power of the presidency to explain to the American people what is at risk with what the MAGA Republicans are doing right now in this moment. Uh, I think it's important for them to know the different provisions that he has put on the table in order to uh, find cost savings in our federal budget. Republicans, Speaker uh, McCarthy and others want to act like uh, Democrats are, are spending too much. What, what, what President Biden put on the table in one case was actually a proposal to reduce prescription drug costs, which would save our federal budget even more money beyond what we're already doing in Medicare, and the Republicans walked away from that. So my, my simple request to the president is use the power of the presidency, talk directly to the American people on what's at stake, let them know about the dire uh, situation that Republicans are putting us in, we're willing to negotiate, but what we're not willing to do is to be held hostage or have our constituents held hostage. All right. We await news on uh, the debt ceiling negotiations. Uh, Congressman, as you noted, you are in South Carolina today. The Congressional Black Caucus, Caucus is launching this summer of action in an effort toward mobilizing uh, black voters. You're going to tour 10 cities, including many across the South. What can you tell us about this effort? And specifically, you are launching this um, on the weekend that falls on the third anniversary of George Floyd's murder, where there are many Americans who are, especially black people across the country, who are dismayed by the lack of action from Congress when it comes to police reform. You know, I'm, I'm here in Charleston, South Carolina. It's raining, uh, but I'm, I'm here because I know 
fundamentally what is at stake. And I want to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Institute, which is actually hosting uh, this uh, democracy for the people uh, with the leadership of Chairman Benny Thompson. We started here in South Carolina because all great things happen here in South Carolina, but it's also because of the historic uh, nature of the issues and the rights that have been won in places like South Carolina. So, yes, the Congressional Black Caucus Institute and members of the CBC will be traveling across the country this summer doing three things. Number one, helping to educate our constituents about what is at stake with the decisions coming down from the Supreme Court on voting rights, on affirmative action, on attacks on our fundamental existence that's happening in states, the banning of books, the elimination of black history. These are issues that we will not be silenced on. The second thing is we're focused on voter registration and making sure that every eligible voter knows how much power they have to make change in local, state, and federal elections. And third, we're focused on organizing, talking to local constituents about what they can do to help organize and build a movement so we have the message to mobilize on the ground. We're here in South Carolina, but we'll be coming to another city close to you. All right, Democratic Congressman from Nevada, Stephen Horsford, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. You are in God's country today. My husband is from South Carolina, so I do believe South Carolina is one of the best places in America. Thank you for your time.